with clay, you work quickly because it's drying out. And sometimes you, you work so quick you don't know what you're doing almost. You're working from instincts and um, you can refine it a little bit like I'm doing right now. But sometimes you, you have to have the courage to just go ahead and change it. I'm not, oh, I don't think I'm spoiling it. I think I'm making it better. Well, that kind of blue-green flame that's beginning to come out of the kill, it's a mixture of uh, flame from gas and then copper oxide and uh, salt. And that affects the uh, color of the pieces. You get mesmerized. But the only thing you can do is smoke a cigar. I think the, the work is hopefully becoming more complicated and complex than when I was a kid. So that if you look at you know, what you're doing now and what you did 10 years ago, it should be a, a big difference. I was born in uh, Summerfield, Illinois. My dad was a Mennonite minister. So kind of like an army brat, we moved a lot until I was drafted. <laughs> Paul Soldner was a medic in World War II, where he helped liberate and care for the victims of the Mautazen concentration camp. After this profound experience, he changed his personal direction from medicine to art. Because of GI Bill, um, was able to get a, a master's degree in art and an MFA degree. When I was first beginning, it was more of therapy or just fun, like a hobby. In 1947, Paul married Ginny Geiger, a dairyman's daughter and childhood friend. She grew up three houses away. Like Paul, Ginny was an artist. Once I started training to be an artist, it was not fun. It was pretty difficult. My teacher, Peter Volkus, had made a big breakthrough in the use of clay as an artistic medium. And it was so powerful, his influence. I think got swept up in that to use clay in a more creative way, more inventive way. Paul's MFA show helped spark a revolution in the use of clay as sculpture, and it put him at the front of an art movement. On a 1952 road trip, as Soldner describes it, Aspen found us. They were intrigued by the old buildings, the music festival, and the blossoming cultural scene. They knew they had found a like-minded community. I thought I might want to come to Aspen and make pots for the tours, but uh, that didn't last long. Becoming a serious artist was more important than anything else. Paul and Ginny fell in love with a sage-covered meadow outside of Aspen and bought the property from Dr. Burlingame. He threw in two extra acres after I said, we'll take these three. He said, well, you guys might want two more acres. Didn't charge us extra. They camped on it with daughter Stephanie every summer for 10 years, slowly working to build a home. The permit process in 1956 was ideal for the Soldner's free sense of architecture and design. When I went in for uh, a permit, he was very casual and said, well, do you have any blueprints? Or if you don't have blueprints, have you got a drawing? Or if you don't have a drawing, you've got a photograph of somebody else's house that you would like to submit? And he said, that's fine. Go ahead. You got your permit, $10. <laughs> he never came out to inspect it. Well, I was able to design and build my place with a philosophy that it should get better with time. Most buildings are the best the day you move in. Mostly everything is just natural. And now the lichen is beginning to grow on the, on the walls. While still in school, Paul improved on the traditional potter's wheel and clay mixing machines. It grew into a business and new creative outlet. The posters and ads for Soldner mixers are collector's items today for locals who remember the wild times mixing mud, building kilns, drinking Paul's dandelion wine, and enjoying his quiet, irreverent wit. A nascent interest in Japanese raku pottery 
led him to develop his own kiln firing methods by trial and error. Soldner's style of working clay became widely known as American Raku. For students and curators, his work was raw and exciting, a jazz-like stream of consciousness, reducing ceramic traditions to their basic elements. He found his place in an art world that was ripe for earthy, honest innovation. The usual assumptions about symmetry and purpose for pottery were thrown out. See that one tipping over? My dad went to see a show the other day. He said one of them, he saw one of my pots in the show. Why don't you make them so they stand up? <laughs> it seems that apparently one of them broke or something in shipment, and uh, it fell over. I mean, it wouldn't stand up in the show. He said, why don't you make your pot so they stand up? Yeah. We had some interesting conversations, too, like, you want to know why I always had to ruin everything I made? And I said, what do you mean, Dad? He said, well, you throw it real nice and round and everything, then you change it, you make it ugly. And I said, well, you know, that's why I like it. I'm tired of them being all around. And then he said, uh, I thought an artist's role was to make beauty. And, uh, what do you say to that? And finally I said, well, what's beauty? Soldner taught art at Scripps College and other universities for 37 years, and he remains a mentor for ceramic artists around the world. His teaching style demystifies, charms, and inspires. This began as a studio. I converted it to a gallery when my wife passed away. This is a portrait of Ginny, my wife. Damn good painter. I made the gallery partly to show her work, some of it's here, but also it's become a, a gallery for my own work. And upstairs is a place, a crash pad for young people who come through, young potters and have no money. His presence in Aspen attracted local potters who asked him to teach. In the 1960s, the developers of Snowmass offered them some old ranch buildings with attractive terms. And Soldner became an artistic godfather for Anderson Ranch. And they said, we don't need these ranches for a number of years. If there's any of them that you would like to use, Fine. We said, well, how much rent? And they said, well, maybe you could make some ashtrays for the office. He understates it, but his influence has been profound. Living and making art are the same thing for Paul Soldner. It's his hope and intention that Anderson Ranch acquire his home for continued use as an art center. His house and studio are, in fact, his largest sculptures. And like Soldner himself, they are important parts of Aspen's cultural history.